to the future of work. Mike Palmer here. I'm delighted today to be joined by coach, consultant, and author of a recent book that's uh, really interesting for those of us trying to track where the world of work is going and how we can remain relevant. The book's called Forever Employable. The author is Jeff Gotthelf. Jeff, welcome to Trending in Education. Thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. You've written several books uh, and I've been mm -hmm. exposed to them in several contexts. We'd love to get a perspective to start on our guest's origin story. And I know that's a big part of Forever Employable because in many ways you're the protagonist of that book. Can you share with us what got you to this point in your professional life and, and why that might be relevant to our audience? Absolutely. After college, I had a brief stint as a wannabe rock star and touring in bands around the East Coast of the United States that quickly failed, as most of those things do. And I ended up working in the web. This is the late 90s. And in the late 90s, if you could spell HTML, you could get a job. And so I was always gravitating towards computers anyway as a kid. I found myself doing front-end design and development in the web 1.0 world, the kind of the original dot-com world, mm -hmm. which was a really fantastic time to be working in technology because nobody knew what they were doing. I had no idea what I was doing. And we learned on the client's dime. I worked in an agency and the clients threw so much money at this internet thing. Yeah. And so we learned a lot. We learned a ton. I learned a ton. I spent a decade doing design. And as the web became more interactive and more robust, the nature of the design work that I was doing became more interesting. Interaction design, user mm -hmm. experience design. Mm -hmm. And about 10 years into my career, I found myself uh, managing a team in New York, actually at a company called The Ladders, managing a design team and struggling with figuring out how to do modern software design with modern software development. The, the nature of modern software development has been changing radically over the last 20 years overall, but really the last five to 10, it's really taken on a whole new way of working with agile software engineering. That's another big trend. Design never originally was conceived as part of this new way of working. And so my job was to build my team and figure out how to make design work in this new world. We spent a couple of years figuring this out inside the organization, outside the organization. And when we figured out a solution that worked for us, I began writing about it and sharing it and speaking about it because I knew this was a challenge, not just us for other folks around the world. So I basically began to export it out from the internal work that we were doing. That turned into my first book. The book was called Lean UX, mm -hmm. uh, it's being user experience. And, and I wrote that with my uh, longtime co-author and collaborator, Josh Seiden, mm -hmm. um, also based in Brooklyn. Yeah. And writing that first book really changed my life. Just to jump in on that too, that book yeah. was very prescient. Uh, you were able to identify the opportunity to extend lean and agile into design at a relatively early stage. We're a trend spotting show, so I'm just reinforcing your bona fides on that spot. In some ways, maybe you caught a trend. In some ways, maybe you even helped accelerate a trend. I think for our listeners who may be interested in learning and education, something I've seen much more of late is agile and lean practices now extending into higher ed and extending into other areas of education. So I think there's a lot to be learned around what led to you identifying this trend, writing a book about it, and in some ways that set the table for the rest of your story. So look, for us in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, this was a necessity. The software engineering team was starting to work this way. And because Agile came from software engineers, they had a recipe so they could follow that recipe. We had to figure out how to insert ourselves into that recipe successfully. So <laughs> the work that we were doing there came out of the necessity of simply doing our jobs with our colleagues in a way that made sense for everybody involved. Now, what's interesting is that you're right. The, the scope of Agile has actually broadened significantly. Today, I find myself doing very similar type of work like I was doing with my design team in 2008, 2009, 2010. But I work either at the organizational level or I work with learning and development inside the organization, HR, finance, uh, legal sometimes, yeah. certain markets, so non-product disciplines mm -hmm. applying these same ideas because they are applicable. Lean UX has really done well, really created a movement around the book and a new way of thinking about design. And that really changed what I was doing professionally. All of a sudden, instead of actually doing the work, I was being asked to teach the work. Mm -hmm. And so I began teaching the work. I didn't know how to do it. I had no formal training. Yep. I recall the first time I ever had to teach a class about 
Lean UX. I had no idea how to do it. I, I worked with the organizer of the event who hired me to do this. And I was upfront with him. I said, listen, you're hiring me to teach a full day class about this topic. I don't know how to do it. And he said, he said, okay, I'll walk it through with you mm. and I'll help you. I'll never forget that. I'm super grateful to him to this day. And that was the first time that I led a room through a course that I designed. Mm -hmm. And since then, largely that's what I've been doing is I've been teaching the material, consulting and coaching, getting more material, and then building courses on top of that. Mm -hmm. Since Lean UX, I published three more books. So the next book after that was a book called Sense and Respond. That was a business book that Josh and I wrote to broaden the conversation. So we talked about, hey, we're talking about software development in Lean UX. How do we broaden the conversation to the entire organization? Mm -hmm. And Sense and Respond was really that aspect of it. And then we began to teach that material. I, I wrote a little pamphlet, very short book, 6,000 words. So. Okay. Um, a long essay called Lean versus Agile versus Design Thinking. Mm. And that really helped us prove out a model for a publishing business that Josh and I have been running for a while mm -hmm. called Sense and Respond Press. And then most recently is Forever Employable. And Forever Employable is really interesting because over the years, as I've been building my business, I've been self-employed now for five years, yep. my personal brand, my network, my platform, my, my reputation. I, I like to use the word oeuvre, your, your oeuvre. Yes. Uh, yeah. I know you're in Barcelona, so I was trying to, trying to add uh, a little bit of continental flavor. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And so regularly, it happens weekly for the last several years, I get an inbound email or, or comments or tweets or whatever. They say, hey, Jeff, how did you get that speaking gig? Or how did you get a book deal? Or how did you mm -hmm. do this? Or how did you get that? So this is signal coming yep. in from my audience that's telling me that there's demand for this content. And so I decided to write a relatively short book about how I built my business mm -hmm. and how I've become what I call forever employable. And fundamentally, if you boil it down to the elevator pitch, it's the subtitle of the book, how to stop looking for work and let your next job find you. What I've worked hard to do in the last 10 years or so is to reverse the dynamics of employment. The traditional employment model is a push model. You're pushing yourself into the market. You're pushing yourself into opportunities. And then you leave the results of this in the hands of other people. I wanted to create a pull model, mm -hmm. a continuous pull model so that at any given moment, my brand, my platform mm -hmm. is attracting opportunities towards me so that no matter what happens to work that I'm doing, whether I'm employed full time or consulting or whatever it is, there's always a flow, a steady stream of inbound opportunities mm -hmm. so that I've got this kind of career safety net. If one client goes away, there's three others in the inbox. That's it. Right. And so that's what the book is about. As you said, I'm the protagonist in that it's a semi-autobiographical story starting on the day I turned 35. If, if you want to find out what happened before I turned 35, you got to ask me. But from 35 on, it's in the book. And then other people's stories as well. Lots of case studies to prove that this isn't like just another tech bro right. talking about this kind of stuff. Yeah. This is stuff that lots of people have done different kinds of people mm -hmm. in different industries, in different ways. And it's a viable way to rethink your career and really recapture control of it and reduce the stress, especially in these uncertain times. Yes. My goal is really to help folks reduce the stress of employment and employability mm -hmm. because, hey, pandemic hit a year ago and a lot of people lost their jobs. Yeah. The people who have done well in the pandemic are the people who do what I talk about in the book. Mm. It's not to say that other people haven't done well, but right. people that I know that do what I talk about in the book have survived and, and in a lot of cases thrived in the pandemic yeah. as well. And so yeah. I'm hoping that the book helps folks. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic read. It's a really uh, relevant topic, particularly for a lot of the reasons you were describing. One of the trends that we've been tracking on the show is resilience and, and also anti-fragility, which is the other flavor of it, is folks who thrive in disruptive environments. Can you talk a little bit about how some of the recommendations in here and some of your insights can help folks uh, become more resilient and start to thrive in somewhat chaotic times? What types of tactics or mindsets you think are relevant for folks to take away from this conversation? Clearly they, they need to get, go out and grab this book, but in addition to the book, anything you can share 
around shifts of your mindset or your approach to your professional life that will help you weather some of the tumults that we're all living through these days? I think we have a tremendous opportunity today with the, the tools that are available to literally everybody. So first of all, you have an opportunity to share your story, your experience, and your expertise broadly in a variety of different ways, in the ways that best suit you and best suit the people that you're trying to reach with that conversation. And what that does is it starts to build your credibility publicly. It's not to say that you're not credible today, but if nobody knows about you, mm -hmm. then you have to prove yourself every single time that you seek uh, a new job, a new opportunity, a new teaching gig, whatever it is. So by sharing your story, by telling your story, you start to build that public credibility and that reputation, that network, and that audience. So that's the first opportunity. And there's a lot of noise out there, but nobody has your story. Nobody has done the things that you've done in the way that you've done them. So your perspective is the thing that you want to share mm -hmm. and your steps that you've taken to get where you are today. The other opportunity is teaching. Mm -hmm. There's a whole section in the book called Teach. And for me, again, 15 years ago, if you would have said, Jeff, what are you going to be when you grow up? The word, I guarantee you 100%, the last thing that would have come to mind would have been teacher. Because mm -hmm. it just didn't dawn on me that was something that either that I was good at or that even had played a role in my career path that I had envisioned for myself mm -hmm. when I was in my 30s. Today, I'm a teacher. You ask me what I do for a living. I teach yeah. every day. Like I'm teaching right now mm -hmm. in this conversation. That's the way that I see it. Mm -hmm. There's so many opportunities to teach today from live webinars to mm -hmm. completely self-service courses on services like Udemy yeah. and Treehouse and, and that type of thing. You can write books. You can yeah. self-publish those books. There's so many opportunities for you to, to be able to share your expertise. Mm -hmm. to, again, build not, not only a, an audience and a reputation, but also a secondary revenue stream. You don't have yeah. to quit your day job to do this. And eventually, if this starts to build, you, you can actually shift from maybe full-time employment to, the, to this other stuff if you want to. Yeah. But the idea here is there's a giving back mentality. So the last step in the book that I talk about is the generosity of giving back and giving a lot of your expertise away for free. Yes. And then thinking logically, giving back, eventually you create some opportunities to monetize some of that expertise. What I found is that the more generous that you are to your community, to your target audience, the, the more they repay you in the future. Yeah. The world has changed in that respect too, where in many ways your audience is driving. I was struck by that too, where on the one hand, the importance of storytelling to remaining relevant and getting out ahead of trends and staying employable. And then also thinking about yourself almost as a product and leveraging some of the, the lean practices and the design thinking that you and others have taught us all to think about software products and then UX and these other things. In many ways, in the modern workforce, we need to think of ourselves to some extent as a product and then get the story so people understand what that product is. Look, there's risk in this, right? So people listening to it, they'll be like, Jeff, that's nice, but I have a full-time job and I have a family. And mm -hmm. if I sneak away to do this or I invest my time, what if my boss sees it, that type of thing, there's risk. 100%, right? There's risk in making this shift. And especially if you don't already have a following or an audience or a network yep. and you're starting from zero, there's a lot of work to be done. No, no doubt about it. And so these agile and lean principles work equally as well here because what you're ultimately doing is you're building a service. The service that you're building is the sharing and monetization ultimately of your expertise. Mm -hmm. The book talks about writing hypotheses about how you think you're going to reach an audience, what you're going to provide, what format you're going to provide it in, who you're going to provide it for, and how do you know that it's working? What are the behavior changes that you want to see in your target audience? So, for example, one of the fundamental practices that I talk about in my day-to-day -day job, which is product development and, and coaching of agile teams, is that the production of the product is not a measure of success. Just because you made a thing mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's a good thing. We call that output. The thing that you're actually looking to generate is outcome. You're looking to generate a measurable change in the behavior of the people who are consuming the thing that you're making. The same holds true here. Producing the book, producing the blog post, producing yeah. the podcast mm -hmm. or the online course is not a measure of success. Did anybody listen? Did yeah. anybody download? 
Did anybody share with their friends? Did they come back and listen to two podcast episodes? Yeah. And so we set those success criteria, which is actually liberating because it gives you the opportunity to then explore different approaches. You're giving yourself the okay to say, well, I did it this way mm -hmm. and five people listened to my podcast. So let me try something else. Mm -hmm. It makes it okay. Be like, I did that okay. Eight people listened that time. Okay, that's good. That's 60% right. improvement. We're doing great. It gives you the permission to continue to iterate and explore and make things better and move things forward. And so you're holding yourself accountable to these metrics of behavior rather than the production. Of course, you have to make stuff. Yeah. But the idea is that you don't spend too much time on it until you can prove that this is a viable channel, that it's a viable format, that there's an audience there. All the same principles that I work with teams who built digital products and services apply here to this content service, this education service mm -hmm. that you're building. Yeah. And what struck me there, and it was challenging for me thinking about it on the, the product development side, was letting go of things that I thought were valuable and pivoting based on those inputs that you're describing. It does seem as though it's almost the harder part of your lesson is learning to let go of things that may not be working. Because I think a lot of us tend to hold them more closely when we feel at risk or threatened. Can you talk a little bit about the, the courage it takes and, and how to let go of things that you may in your heart of hearts think work? Yeah, there's really two sides to that answer. The first side is about your current work and your current job and your current employment situation. 10 years into my career, I was a designer. That's what I did. That's what I was good at. That's how people knew me. That's what it said on my resume. I was managing a design team. I had enough credibility to lead other designers. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was doing. After I wrote Lean UX, I began to get pulled away from day-to-day -day design work. Somebody asked me the other day if I was still doing UX consulting. And it's been a really long time since I designed an actual digital product. Yeah. You know, designed lots of things, courses and classes and talks and whatever, but organizations. But an actual digital product, it's been a long time. That terrified me. As I was being pulled away to, to do this teaching stuff, I was already worried that I was not going to be employable for very much longer mm -hmm. as a design leader. However, as I was being pulled away from design, I was terrified to let that go because that was my income. That was my identity. So that was the first thing that really was tough, let go. But there was such clear inbound signal from the market to me that there was an appetite for this content yeah. that I took the risk and I jumped. So that's one side of the answer to your question. The other side is once you start doing this thing, we're like, okay, look, I'm going to create a, a reputation for myself, some social proof that I'm smart and that I know what I'm talking about. So you start to write or you start to create some short videos or maybe some presentations or whatever it is. And then no one pays any attention to it. Yep. It's like you poured your heart into a blog post and seven people read it and four of them have the same last name as you. <laughs> It's stuff like that. So you made a video and it got two views and it yeah. one of them was that kind of thing. And that's, it's soul crushing. It sucks. I hate it. I love my ideas. <laughs> Everyone loves their ideas. I love the things that I produce. I take pride in them. doesn't matter how long I spend on them. I take pride in them. And sometimes they don't work. Nobody reads the blog post or not enough people buy tickets to the workshop. At some point, you have to listen to what your target audience is telling you mm -hmm. in those situations. And what the market and your audience is telling you is that they don't want this. You might think it's awesome, but they don't want it. And so you've got to let it go. Look, go talk to them mm -hmm. and understand why they don't want this. Yeah. That'll give you a better sense of what they do want, but then let it go. So that frees up cycles for you to do the next thing. Mm -hmm. Kill your darlings. You've heard yeah. that. Maybe you've heard that phrase. I've been doing this. I've been working this way and teaching this way of working now for probably 15 years. And it's the toughest part. Yeah. The toughest part is letting go of your ideas because your ideas are awesome. My ideas are awesome. And people who don't like them are stupid. They don't know. They don't get it. You have to let it go. And it's hard. It's, it's really hard. I, I blog every week. Every Monday morning, there's a blog post that comes up there. So the blog post that I write, I'm like, man, that's a really good one. And relatively speaking, nobody reads it. And I yeah, tweet yeah. about it and I LinkedIn about it and nobody reads it. And then I posted this thing like a month ago that was just this crowdsourcing piece that I wrote, 12 icebreakers to help you kick off your next Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. Five times more popular than anything I've yeah. ever written in the last year. 
And I spent like 15 minutes putting that yeah. together. Like, we, we, you know? we, we might need to bring you back for that one because I think I, I may want to borrow from what you've learned from your audience. If folks want to find your blog, Jeff, or they want to track you or understand any of this stuff, where should they go? jeffgodhealth.com. So that's really the easiest place to go. And then LinkedIn is really good too. All my links are there as well. Awesome. Those two destinations are great. You did mention in addition to the book being out that you're running uh, some workshops for Forever Employable. We'll share all this out in the show notes, but uh, but just while we're talking, where should folks go if they want to track any of that stuff down around Forever Employable? Foreveremployable.com. We'll get you to the book website. Obviously, everything's on jeffgodhealth.com. And if you're curious about the workshop, you can go to becomingforeveremployable.com, which is a 10-week course. We're in the middle of a cohort right now. The next one kicks off in April. So uh, there's still time to join and there's always limited capacity. Great stuff. I was struck by the importance of teaching. You just mentioned it. And I think a lot of our listeners are... If not teachers, they're likely teacher adjacent. Do you have specific advice for folks who are in uh, the education community? I like to call them learning professionals. If you are someone who's made a career in education, whether you're a teacher or an instructional designer or someone who's in ed tech or in administration and anywhere across the spectrum, if you're in learning and talent at an organization, anything that you think is specifically resonant uh, to that audience? Absolutely. Look, every industry has a community and every community has leaders in that community, thought leaders, experts, the people that you look up to. The ability today to become one of those leaders, to become present in that conversation is easier than ever, but it does take effort. It takes effort. It takes consistency. The first part of the book is called Plant Your Flag. Mm -hmm. And really, it's the first exercise that I recommend, which is to decide what you want to be known for in your community. What, what do you want to build your reputation around? And it's an exercise in right-sizing the flag that you're going to build as the foundation for your reputation and your network. You don't want to go too broad, but like education right. is enormous. huge, yeah. enormous, right? It's just way too broad, way too generic. You don't want to go too narrow, which is like German language education for veterinarians. That feels like that's a little, yeah. it's niche. May, may, yeah. I mean, there's an, there's an audience for I, it. There, right? are, there are German shepherds out there, but there are other varietals uh, of pooches. So yes. Exactly. It's somewhere in between those two that leverages your passions, your expertise, and, and your experience. And then it's an effort in consistency and frequency in establishing yourself as the person who knows about that. Wherever your community hangs out, mm -hmm. participate. Mm -hmm. Participate in the conversations. Join in the conversations. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to what the thought leaders are already doing. Submit to speak at one of your industry conferences. Post some ideas in the discussion forums wherever your folks hang out and see what kind of feedback you get. Offer up a free presentation. I did one yesterday. I did a free webinar yesterday on objectives and key results. It was an hour-long presentation. Mm -hmm. That's it. One hour. Literally, I did. 90 minutes of prep for it. So two and a half hour effort, roughly speaking, 315 people signed up, about 150 showed up, but that's a terrific way to test your ideas. Our audience should track, if they're not aware of it, OKRs is the initialism that goes with objectives and key results. So yeah. a lot of the things that you've identified are what I like to call zeitgeisty. Frequently you're saying things or you're identifying things that if you're not aware of these topics or these ideas, you can also borrow from folks like yourself, Jeff, to see what's working, what are the thought leaders doing, or what are the terms of art that are picking up traction? And then does that relate to me? Do I have the permission to be a thought leader in that realm? If you're interested in doing this kind of thing, there are folks in your industry doing this, and I would look to see what they're doing and learn from them. Mm -hmm. There are folks outside of your industry that are very successful at this as well, see what they're doing because you can always lift ideas from them and then recombine them. Everybody's got a favorite YouTuber these days, right? You don't have to be like a 15 year old kid to have a favorite YouTuber. My favorite YouTuber is a guy named Rick Beato. Mm. Rick Beato is a musician. He's in his mid fifties. He's worked with literally everybody in the business and he's particularly musically gifted. He's got two and a half million YouTube subscribers to his channel and he makes these amazing 15, 20 minute videos where he dissects songs, he just breaks them apart. It's a series called What Makes This Song Great? Mm. And he'll pick like Tom Sawyer by Rush. Everything he picks is music that I know and love. Yeah. Right? And, and the quality of his videos and the way that he edits and everything. So I've learned a ton from him. And, and as I start to think about making more videos, 
I'm definitely going to focus on doing something like that. I was also curious to get your perspective on the imposter syndrome, because it does feel like you've heroically powered through it a lot is what I picked up on from the book. But I'd love to hear you talk a little more about that. The imposter syndrome thing, everyone has it, literally everyone. I, I don't know any tricks other than to push the publish button. As we're going through the, the Becoming Forever Employable workshop now, yeah. the cohort, I've got uh, a few folks in that class who have great ideas and are terrified of pushing the publish button. Yeah. So there's so much noise out there. Why would anyone listen to me? Shoot. Just ship it. The work doesn't count if you don't ship it. Mm -hmm. And I told you before, you're going to be shouting into the void for a while. That's just something you get used to. And thinking about the folks who've done this particularly well, there's a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary Vaynerchuk is a marketer yeah. mm -hmm. who has become remarkably successful over the last, I don't know, 15 years or so mm -hmm. based on creating content. And I buy into his philosophy that it's quantity over quality. Mm -hmm. Make more stuff and then you'll start to make better stuff. But ultimately, yeah. quality is in the eye of the consumer, the, per mm -hmm. the person who's consuming your content. And so just make more stuff. I told you I was blogging every Monday. I started that last September. Uh -huh. I used to blog once a month. Mm -hmm. Now I go every week. So I've quadrupled my writing pace. Yeah. And in that time frame, I've increased traffic to my blog by 50%. Mm -hmm. And again, some of those posts hit, yeah. many of them don't. And so the imposter thing, the only thing I can say is like everybody feels it. Yeah. We have it. You just got to ship it. The work doesn't count if you don't ship it. So yeah. Yeah. Put it out there. And also, I like to quote Nelson Mandela whenever I can. And he famously said, I never lose. I either win or learn. So yeah. once, once you publish, in some ways, you learn more from the, the dismal numbers than the great ones. The hard work, I think, is frequently understanding why did it miss and trying to get some hypotheses about that and then continue to get better, continue to be iterative, adopt some of these lean practices you've been espousing. Folks really should, at this point, understand lean. But if they don't understand lean and agile and design thinking, we mentioned lean UX, but are there any other places you would recommend for amateurs or neophytes when it comes to uh, lean practices, design thinking, that kind of stuff? At, at the risk of, I'm going to plug myself. Please. Again. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I wrote a very short book, 6,000 words called Lean versus Agile versus Design Thinking. Mm -hmm. And it, it answers the question 30 to 40 minutes worth of reading, depending on how fast you read. It literally has a very brief overview of each of those practices. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, at the end, I talk about the unifying principles across all three. Also, that's a great place to start. It's on Amazon. It's part of the Sense and Respond Press series. Great. And it's available in audiobook if you want somebody to read it to you. I like to talk about how folks like stuff coming in from their learn holes at times, also known as yeah. their ears. So maybe the audiobook makes sense. I did see also Forever Employables on Audible too. And if you like what you're hearing from Jeff, in addition to reading him, you can listen to his words as we're rounding the quarter post here, I don't know which post we're rounding, but we're towards the latter half, latter third of the show. We also like to get our guest perspectives on what do they see on the horizon? What's coming down the road? I know you're agile and you try to respond to what you see right now. So you don't want to get too far out ahead or too far over your skis as the parlance goes. Wayne Gretzky likes to talk about skating to where the puck is going. So where do you see things headed? For me, it's doubling down on this venture into the creator economy. The other day I was watching YouTube with my kids. It was one of their favorite YouTubers that I was watching. And Mr. Beast, in case you oh, know Mr. Of course, Beast. Of course, yeah. The statistic that, that he mentioned in his show was that 6,600 YouTube accounts hit 1 million subscribers in 2020. Wow. Yeah. Almost 7,000 accounts wow. hit a million subscribers. And there's about 25,000 accounts that hit half a million subscribers. Mm. So there's endless appetite mm -hmm. out there for those people who are willing to take advantage of that reality and who are willing to figure out how to become interesting to their target audience and to iterate and to experiment and to learn. There's a tremendous opportunity. So for me, that's where I'm headed. I'm headed in that direction. Mm -hmm. The forever employable content that I'm doing right now is high touch a high cost, uh, low yep. volume. Mm -hmm. By the end of the year, I'm hoping to have an offering that's the exact opposite of that. So it's a self-serve, yep. low cost, high volume course that you can get through. That starts to take me personally out of the equation on a daily basis. Yep. That's really nice for me. It gives me focus. It starts to fund my other activities. Yeah. So really leaning heavily into this kind of creator economy mm -hmm. world and doubling down on forever employable. I think it's the right ideas 
at the right time and they seem to be working. It seems to be taking off. So I'm really happy about that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you definitely caught a trend early once again, which good on you. Real quick, as we wrap, any thoughts on the the formats or the, the platforms that people should use or the approach to getting their message out there? You mentioned YouTube. You've talked about a wide range of content formats. Any insight or any recommendations on folks if they want to get themselves out there, how they should go about that? Yeah. So a little cliche, but fish where the fish are. So wherever your community hangs out, yeah. that's where you should be. Whatever tool or social media platform or group they use, that's where you should be. So for example, for me, it's Twitter and it's LinkedIn mm -hmm. these days. And I used to write pretty heavily on Medium. Mm -hmm. Now, the downside to using social media, the upside is your people are there, the distribution algorithms are there, and then you can play them in your favor. And you can build an audience there. The downside is you're renting that audience. Mm -hmm. You don't own that audience. Yeah. And so ultimately, you, what you want to do is you want to start to own your audience. What does that mean? You bring them to your website. You sign them up for your email list. You provide content that you own in a space that you own ultimately. But if people don't know you, that's tough at first. So using Medium and Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram <laughs> to get your ideas out there is fine. But eventually, you want to bring those people in-house so that you own that audience and you're not renting it from Facebook or from yeah. Twitter or from YouTube or whatever. Awesome. Any final thoughts, Jeff? This was amazing. Uh, you were a teacher, so you did deliver on your promise. Hopefully uh, our listeners got as much value out of this conversation as I did. Any concluding thoughts or things to take away from this conversation as we wrap up? I think that we all live in this system sense. I have to provide for myself. I have to provide for my family. I've got to make sure that I can do this for the foreseeable future and beyond. The reality for the majority of us out there is that we are not in control of that. The ideas in Forever Employable, the ways that I've been building my career shift that dynamic. It puts you back in control mm -hmm. and it gives you the ability through hard work. Let's not BS it, right? You've got to put in the work, but through hard work, you can turn that dynamic around 180 degrees and put yourself in the driver's seat and then decide what you want to do and how you want to do it and how much of it you want to do and what you want to take a break. And to me, that's so empowering and, and liberating that uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Uh, it's a great way to end. Jeff Gotthelf, the author of Forever Employable. You can check him out at jeffgotthelf.com. We'll share links to his books and all the references that he made throughout the, the conversation. Definitely someone to, to keep an eye on and to track if you want to understand where the world is heading and how to build a resilient future for yourself which is something I think we all want to do. If you like what you're hearing, follow us on Twitter, visit us at trendingandeducation.com and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Jeff, thanks again for joining. My pleasure, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. And for our listeners, we'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education.